Hello everybody. Welcome to PowerShell 24, or Push 24, or 24 hours of learning about PowerShell. It's amazing. Let's talk about, I ain't no data scientist. Why do I need Jupyter Notebooks? Let's press the right button as well. There we go. So my name's Rob Sewell. Uh, you can get in touch with me on Twitter at SQL DBA with Beard. Um, here are some other things about me. I'm a consultant. Once upon a time, I was a production SQL DBA. These days, I just help people automate stuff and get stuff going. In the world of COVID, this is where I work. This is my office at home in the southwest of the UK. And I thought you might like to see what it looks like for a bloke with a beard who spends his day automating stuff. This is the planet Jupiter, the South Pole, in fact, taken on a flyby by Juno, the spaceship. But we're not going to be talking about that Jupiter. We're going to talk about this Jupiter. The name comes from the planet Jupiter. And the languages that are supported initially, Julia, Python, and R. But most importantly, because Galileo discovered the moons of Jupiter, and he was the first person who did this. And he included in his results the data that he used to make those calculations. Reproducibility is one of the core foundations of Jupyter Notebooks. So, what is a Jupyter Notebook? So, first of all, people like Terry, there's Terry, uh, and, and Simon, data scientists, they were the initial people who used Jupyter Notebooks. They train models with data to provide predictions using Spark and Python and R and other things that I just don't understand. So, let's go back in time to 2006. And in 2006, we were running PowerShell in a blue box. We moved forward, we got to 2010. Hey, guess what? We've got new PowerShell, PowerShell version two, and we run it in a blue box. But we had the ISE as well. Hello, ISE. 2012, look, upgraded PowerShell, even more. PowerShell version three, still in a blue box. <clears throat> but updated ISE as well, it's got a command add-on, you could have a single console pane, all these improvements coming through. 2017, hey, hey PowerShell five in a blue box still. Icons a little bit different, We've got a little bit more we can do. New and improved, slightly shinier ISE. It's awesome. 2018 brought us PowerShell 6, PowerShell Core, works cross-platform, and this time an improvement, a black box. Excellent. In between times, Visual Studio Code came along. Hi, David. In 2019, Windows Terminal came through with support for PowerShell, Windows PowerShell and PowerShell Core. And in all of these versions, for a decade and a half, Houston, we've had a problem. Now I know some of the clever folk here are gonna be saying things like, 
transcripts, Rob, about logging, Rob, about all of these methods that we can do this. But straight out of the box, without some effort, every single one of these has got a fundamental problem in its use cases. Here it is, outlined for you in yellow. Visual Studio Code still has the same problem. Here it is, just about there. So, let me explain to you one of the best reasons that I think that you should be looking at Jupyter Notebooks for your PowerShell code. Imagine, three o'clock in the morning, your pager goes off. Okay, your pager duty alert goes off. And you run off to your laptop very quietly, trying to not to wake the baby or the dog or your significant other. And you log into your VPN and you go to the jump box. No, not that jump box, the other jump box. Oh, we go to the jump box. And you have a set of commands that you run, a script maybe. Maybe you've got a run book in OneNote to help you identify why has this thing broken and how can I fix it? And in doing so, you run some code and you get some results. And for a decade and a half, I've been screenshotting those results. I've been logging them into transcripts. I've been copying and pasting them into OneNote documents, into Word documents, onto Notepad, writing them down on pieces of paper. All of these things to make sure that I knew what it was had happened when something went wrong and how to move forward with it. <clears throat> but the next day, when you go in to your wash-up meeting, your retrospective, whatever you might call it, the meeting where you sit down with the rest of your team and you work out, how did this go wrong? How can we make sure that it gets, that it doesn't happen again? What can we do to automatically fix it? You really want to have all of those results available to you. And the problem is, once you've pressed that cross, all of your information gone. Your results just aren't there. They're completely gone. They've vanished. I know. I'll reiterate it. There are ways and means that you can make sure that that doesn't happen. But that means some setup. It means making sure that everybody's machine has got that. I know there are ways to automate that as well. But why don't we just make it simpler? We don't want our results just to go away. We need them, especially in this use case. So what is a Jupyter Notebook, Rob? Okay, let's make it easy for old people with beards to understand. A Jupyter Notebook is a document that can contain text, executable code, images, and query results. Straight out of the box. Awesome. My preferred IDE for Jupyter Notebooks is Azure Data Studio. And I'm gonna show you some things that it can do that you can't do in Visual Studio Code because I think they're cool. Azure Data Studio is a cross-platform desktop that works, that's used by data professionals in the main. Now, some of you are looking at that and going, hang on a minute, that looks just like Visual Studio Code. Come on, why do we need to use this? It's crazy talk, Rob. What are you talking about here? Because, yeah. One side you've got Azure Data Studio, the other side you've got Visual Studio Code. They look the same because they're based on the same code base. <clears throat> 
Why do we have two of them? Well, simply because data people like pretty colors. Azure Data Studio has a lot of widgets, a lot of dashboards, a lot of overlays that it adds on to interacting with data solutions that make pretty colors and keep data people happy. I'm a data person, so it keeps me happy too. But because they use notebooks a lot more, they've added some more functionality that I think will make you think it's worth using this. There's some confusion with notebooks. So we've got notebooks in Azure Data Studio. These are Python, run, sorry, running in Python. These are Jupyter notebooks. They can have PowerShell, they can have SQL, they can have Spark, they can have Python, they can have R. But at Ignite, we had .NET Interactive Notebooks announced. And those are now available. In fact, that blog post link is to the preview two and preview three is, is now out and available. .NET Interactive Notebooks have all the goodness of Jupyter Notebooks, except PowerShell Core and C Sharp and F Sharp and .core HTML and .core JavaScript. So there's a whole lot more that you can do with a .NET Interactive Notebook. I like to use them in Azure Data Studio because there's extra functionality there and because I'm used to creating notebooks in Azure Data Studio. You can also create, use them and create them and run them in Visual Studio Code with the Python extension. As you can see, it's exactly the same notebook as this one, but it's presented a little bit nicer. The use interaction is a little bit nicer. I think it looks better and my clients do as well. <coughs> you can also, with the latest Visual Studio Code and with the .NET Interactive um, Visual Studio Code extension, it's a preview extension, you can also create Visual Studio, ah, uh, Visual Studio Code. You can also create .NET Interactive Notebooks without having to install Python. There's a very simple one that I just created just to show you what it looks like. And you've also got the notebook mode in the PowerShell preview extension for Visual Studio Code. So this brings markdown functionality to your comments and the ability to run your code, your PowerShell code, but it doesn't save the results. So actually, I think that's probably enough talk about notebooks. What we really wanna do is we wanna see some notebooks. And I guess what you're wondering is, how did I do this? Well, just took a little bit of PowerShell and some PowerPoint and Streamlab Ops. It's really cool. Feel free to go to that link there and have a look at how I did it. It also links back to Scott Hanselman's video, which shows how he does it with Ops Studio and in C Shop. So some, some cool stuff there. But my name's Rob. This is how you can get in touch with me. But let's go and have a look at some Jupyter Notebooks. So let's start backwards. So we're gonna start with the PowerShell Notebooks feature in Visual Studio Code. So here we can see that we're in Visual Studio Code and we are in the Insiders version because this only works in the Insiders version for now. And we need to have the preview extension. And as well as that, we need to have added to our settings this. Interesting. 
Thank you very much. That's really handy, that isn't it? Let's let's get out of that and let's let's try it like that. That's much better. So we need to have PowerShell dot notebooks dot show toggle button. Set that one to true as well. Okay. Once you've done that, what you can do, open a PS1 file, and top right you will find this little book here. There it is. A little notebook button that's been added in. So we've just got PowerShell file, we can run it, we can do things. It's just an introduction. But if we press this book, then what we've got is our um, markdown. So you can put your markdown up into here and then we've got some code. And you can also get the buttons coming up so that you can add things in. And you can just press this button and it's going to run the code. It's good, but it's not going to keep your results. So it's a nice start. It's a good place to go. It'll make your PowerShell files look nicer. It means you can put in a little bit more documentation around them. So it's a good way forward if that's what you want to do. Nice quick way of changing your existing PowerShell files as well. Okay, so that's cool. So you wanted to see how I did the PowerPoint. Well, this is the code that does it. You can see it's in documents, uh, in my GitHub, in the functions repository, and it's called PowerPoint slobs because I'm lazy. Unfortunately, it also only works in PowerShell 5. And that's because we can't get this working in core at the moment. But that's what we can do. But let's talk about notebooks. Notebooks are much more fun. Let's try Visual Studio Code. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do Control Shift and P and bring up the command pack palette. And I'm gonna use this toggle screencast mode so that you can see the key presses that I make. And as you can see in my recent history, I've got the notebook uh, commands, but you would search for notebook and we're going to start with a blank Jupyter notebook in Python. So I'm going to hit enter and what that's going to have done is connected me to my local Jupyter server and created me a Python notebook. So what I want to do is I want to change that from Python to .NET PowerShell. And you can see at the bottom that it's flipping over. And now I can have some IntelliSense. Excellent. And then what I'd want to do is just add a new cell, but I get some errors here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a new one. And this time I'm going to leave it in Python and I'm going to add some blocks for me just to make use of in a minute. And then we'll switch. And as you can see, you can switch to any of these Python, um, Spark R, PySpark. You can run PowerShell. So that'll be Windows PowerShell on a Windows machine and PowerShell Core on a non-Windows machine because that's hard coded. And what it's doing is it's taking the command that you put in the code cell, sending it to the package, executing it against the PowerShell XE or the Porsche XE, and then bringing back the results to you and displaying them in the results. So there's a bit of manipulation going on there. And as you can imagine, sometimes stuff goes a bit wonky doing that. But we're gonna go straight into .NET PowerShell. So we'll change it to a .NET PowerShell. And this is the sort of thing that I do in Azure Data Studio. I'll show you in a minute. But quite often uh, when I'm working, delivering value for my clients by building Terraform or talking about how we're migrating data solutions to Azure or whatever it is I'm doing, sometimes I'll get clients come to me saying, hey, uh, this thing's bust. Could you mind having a look? Because you know we figure you might know what's going on or be able to help guide us in the right direction. I'm like, yeah, sure. And I will open up a notebook because we could start by 
clicking on this button here, changing it to uh, Markdown and going, uh, something went wrong. Rob took a look on today's date. Put that in because there's not recorded anywhere what's happening. Um, we'll go uh, get dash service. There we go. First thing I want to check is SQL Server up and running. I'll do Control Enter. Yep, SQL Server's up and running. Excellent. So we'll change that to Markdown and say something like uh, SQL was running. Let's check the error log. Don't care about spelling mistakes right now. I'm dealing with an instant. So we'll go DBA error log uh, minus SQL. Uh, you going to? Ooh, okay. Still loading the module. And uh, we'll just do localhost because that's where we are. There we go. And there's my output was trimmed for performance reasons. But here we go, now I've got my error log from my SQL instance, I can start investigating that. And maybe as I carry on through this notebook, I'll do some interesting things, see what happens. So that's .NET PowerShell, .NET Interactive notebooks running against the Jupyter server and accessing them by Visual Studio Code. You can open existing ones. If we have a look, we could go to here and we've got some .NET notebooks and let's pick mix and match. There we go. You see it opens as a JSON file and then goes, all right, I'll just quickly, uh, we'll trust that one. Quickly flip and this is our notebook. And I could just hit that and run all of the cells. So this notebook was created in Azure Data Studio and it works in Visual Studio Code. So we're okay for IDEs, we can mix and match, that's perfectly okay. So let's have a look at the other, no thank you, I don't want to save that. Let's have a look at the other version. So we'll do Control Shift P and we'll look at .NET Interactive, create a new blank notebook. So it's come up like this. So this required us to have installed this extension. Okay, so our .NET interactive extension, which at the moment it's in preview. So Visual Studio Code Insiders is required. That's not actually true. Because we can run it here. And what we've got is some code. So this will just be get dash, oh, oh, hang on a minute. That doesn't look like PowerShell, no. This time we've got it hidden over here. It says we're in C sharp .NET Interactive. So if I click on that button and let's change it to PowerShell. But before we do, just look, you see you've got other languages that you can use within this format. So we could use C sharp, F sharp, HTML, JavaScript. It's a PowerShell conference, let's use PowerShell. And also I can't write any of those other languages, so let's use PowerShell. We'll do the same thing. There we go, we've got our IntelliSense. We've got a little bit more information about it coming through. Uh, we'll do MS SQL Server and Control and Enter. Oh, not Control and Enter. No, execute cell, uh, it, won't, it won't show you the pop-up that comes up on, on there. But execute cell is control and alt and enter. So we'll do control, alt, enter. There we go, let's run. It's given us a little bit of feedback as to how long it took to run. And we've got our cell. So um, uh, actually what I want to do is add another, ah, there we go. So. There's no code button obvious to you when you look, but if you hover your mouse over the middle of the screen, either above a cell or below a cell, you can add 
code or markdown. So let's add some markdown. I am some markdown. Um, here I am fixing stuff. Uh, we'll hit this tick. There we go. Now we have some markdown with a little arrow there. So we can hide it or bring it up. That's going to bring up our code. So let's add something here. So we said, so SQL is running. Let's check the error lock. Okay. And we'll add some code. And we'll do get, yay, error, error. Not so good, but well, that's okay. Luckily, I know what it is. And now I can do control and alt and enter and, uh, and you what? Error, CS1002 expected. Oh. What's going on here? Oh, look. Holy moly, I've got to change that one to PowerShell as well. Okay, so we could have different languages in different cells. Well, that seems pretty cool. Um, so we've changed that to PowerShell. Uh, this time I'm gonna format table. And there we go. Now we've got our error log happening. So we can just go through, carry on doing our investigation using .NET Interactive Notebooks straight out of Visual Studio Code, no Python installation needed. And if we look here and look at .NET, you can see that you can restart the kernel, save the notebook, stop all of your kernel, stop the current kernel. There's some, a lot of stuff that we can do here and report an issue with the .NET install tool. So if something goes wrong, then you can fire it straight back at the team here, work out how to fix it. So I think that's really cool. There's some good stuff here. If you're happy working in Visual Studio Code, then you can build yourself some notebooks. I don't use these. Um, one of the reasons I don't use these is because I use Azure Data Studio. Azure Data Studio is something that I'm happy working in. As you see, we've got some extra colors here. So if we were to connect to our SQL instance and right click and do manage, and hopefully this then explains the additional features that you get in Azure Data Studio when you're connecting through to data platform things. So we can do all of this stuff. We can build ourselves nice pretty graphs and we can add widgets in so that we've immediately got some uh, information about each of our instances and our databases. There's other things that we can do within this functionality. But let's not worry about that. If you're not interested in any of that, you don't connect to data platform solutions at all, why would you want to use notebooks? Let me show you some reasons why. So we'll do Control Shift and P. And we'll turn on screen pass mode because, hey, this Visual Studio Code and Azure Data Studio share the same code base. It's the same stuff underneath the hood. So we can do what we want to do. So we'll do a new notebook. Okay, so now we've got a new notebook. Hurrah. You see, kind of looks about the same. We've got our kernel here, and our kernel is going to give us the option to change to a different language. These are the same ones that you saw, just normal Python ones. Because I've installed .NET Interactive, then once I change a kernel, it's a little bug that there is in Azure Data Studio, then now I've got my .NET notebook capability available to me. So I'm going to change to the .NET PowerShell kernel, and you can see this is running here, and we're attached to our local host. So, first reason I like it, the cell button is there. Anybody can see it, there's no hiding it behind a mouse, you can go and find it. Over on this side, we've got this button. 
erase all of the results. I like this one too. This is good. And here is our trust our notebook or don't trust it, whether we're allowing it to run code. We look at some code. If this is get service. Hey, guess what? Control and enter. Oh, no, not control and enter. This time we've got F5. F5. Of course it is, it's F5 to run it. Yeah, you've got to remember what your shortcuts are in each thing. It's just the same. We're just running our PowerShell code. And if we add another new cell, then hey, guess what? That one is automatically going to be in this language. So it's going to be in PowerShell in this case. So that's good. And we can also add ourselves some markdown. Now here we've got some extra buttons as well. So you can see our buttons have got cross. That one is close my editor, add a new cell, move the cell up or down within the notebook, or delete. So these are things that I think are much better functionality available to me in Azure Data Studio. So that's that's cool. We can put this at the top. Uh, we could change this to a markdown view. And now this is my heading. I have a live preview to the right. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I kind of like that. All right. Let's change tack. Why else are you going to use a notebook? We've talked about using notebooks as a run book for something that you want to do at three o'clock in the morning. We've talked about how you can use them when you're just called to do an incident. You want to record the work that you're doing. All right. We've been in this game a long time. So I'm pretty sure that you've all got run books of some sort. Okay. Let me open up my OneNote. I'm always going to open it there. There we go. So I would imagine that what you've got is something that looks a bit like this. Yeah, so you've got a OneNote document. It's got some title, it's got some code, we've got bullet points here. This is an image. See, it's definitely an image. It goes on and on and on like that. You know, copying and pasting this into a notebook is going to be hard, isn't it? Okay. Control A, Control C. We'll come to here and we will, let's add a new text cell. Okay, and we are here in this, look, we've got this view here. Quite sure what name this has. I think I do, I'm gonna tell you in a minute, but this is our markdown one. This is straight markdown. This one is preview, notebook on uh, markdown on one side, preview on the other. So we're in the default one. Remember, we've copied from our, not from there, we'll do that in a minute. We've copied from our OneNote and we paste. Holy macaroni, will you look at that? What we've got is our OneNote document. Let's put this one here and let's put that one there. Let's make it a bit bigger. Let's make it a bit bigger. Here we go. Here is our OneNote document. Here is our notebook with our image. <laughs> this is magic. This is sorcery. This is awesome. Okay, we can also, uh, let's do this and let's take a screenshot which covers both of those. Okay, so we've just got this in our clipboard. Only place that particular image ever exists is in our clipboard. Boom. Yep, we've just pasted from our clipboard straight into our notebook. And if we were to edit it and have a look at the markdown, you'll see what it's done is it's base64 encoded it. That's what it's done. But 
as far as your users are concerned, as far as you're concerned, it's just a clipboard. It's just an image that we can see. So uh, let's uh, pick this whole slide. We'll copy that. Uh, we'll add that as a text cell and we'll paste. Boom. Okay, I wonder what happens if we go to, uh, let's take um, Tyler's web page. Okay, so we'll go copy this. We'll yeah, copy a little bit of that and we'll do control C. We'll come back to our notebook and we'll add a new cell and boom. Look at this. This is the web page, we've got the links, we've got the images, they're going to the links, same as the web page. This is awesome. This is stuff that you cannot do in Visual Studio Code. This, I think, is an excellent reason to use Azure Data Studio as your editing instead of Visual Studio Code until it catches up. I mean, it'll catch up. These features will, will move across, especially when each team starts to see what the others can do. Hopefully we can get something together and it'll work. But I just want to say, Mwah. this, love it. I love it, I love it, I love it. It's absolutely awesome. Okay, so maybe you've already got some notebooks. Okay, maybe you've decided that what you're going to do is you've created yourself some not.net notebooks, maybe some things to do with DBA tools. Um, here they are. These are running in PowerShell, straight in the Jupyter notebooks against Python from a year or so ago. You haven't updated them to these new .NET Interactive. How can we do this? Well, let's pick this login and users one. As you can see, it's just ordinary PowerShell. And I'm gonna copy the path. And what I'm going to do is we're gonna have a new window, a uh, new file, Control K and then N, and we'll change this to PowerShell. Because Azure Data Studio with the PowerShell extension, we can just run that, there we go. We've got this. And what I'm going to do is import, ooh, where is it? <laughs> import, uh, there we go. Oh, no, it wouldn't be, would it? Because you didn't actually press there. There we go. It was not loaded because no, oh, thanks. Thanks for that. Let's cd to ADS notebook and let's itmo the ADS notebook module. So this has been published up to the gallery. It's just I hadn't loaded it in here when I ran my demo. We've got the path to our PowerShell, ordinary PowerShell notebook. And what we're going to do is we are going to run convert ads not.net to .net. So we've got a source notebook. We'll take that one. No spaces. Good. Uh, source equals that. There we go. And then we're going to have a destination directory of c slash temp, why not? And I'm gonna run that. That took 56 milliseconds to run. And now, if I go to control, if I go control O and go c slash temp slash 04, uh, no, 04, 04, perhaps would be better. There we go, and we'll open that. This is the one we've just converted, and as you can see, once the kernel loads, what we've got is a .NET PowerShell notebook. 
just converted it from normal PowerShell to a .NET PowerShell notebook. Okay, now what if we're the other way around? What if we've written ourselves our .NET interactive PowerShell notebooks and what we want to do is we want to enable those people to run them in not .NET interactive notebooks. So we want to just run in normal notebooks, either via Jupyter or via um, Azure Data Studio or Visual Studio Code. <laughs> Guess what? All we need to do is run this code. Where's my mouse gone? There we go. And this time we will give a destination name of uh, Jeremy. That'll be funny to just a single person, but it's okay. And now we're going to convert. No, we're not going to do that. We need to convert a dot net to oh, gee whiz. ADS will convert a dot net notebook to a not dot net notebook. Forty eight seconds. No, forty eight milliseconds. Okay. So let's do a control note with our focus up there. And we're in temp. So there's Jeremy. And Jeremy is now going to come back. It was created from this .NET PowerShell notebook, and it is now a PowerShell notebook. Beautiful. So that's the ADS notebook module. Does a lot of good, good things. Here's something important. If we get the content of, um, let's get the content of the C temp slash Jeremy. This is what a notebook looks like on the file system. What we've got is just a load of JSON. So as it happens, this JSON is working with um, the import Excel module, uh, doing a load of formatting, creating some good stuff. But what you can see here is the output. So this is the results of my notebook. So remember, one of the beautiful things I say about a PowerShell notebook is that you get to save the results with the code that you've run and the description of what you've done. It's awesome. It's really good for incident management when we're doing when we're dealing with incidents. Really good for run books when we're recording tasks and steps that we've taken. Really good for demoing so you can people can see what the results are. Really good for presenting sessions. Because if my demo fails, I've already got a notebook with the results preloaded. I can show you, okay, it didn't work, but hey, here are the results from a notebook from the last time I ran it. Excellent. But equally, if your output from your PowerShell contains something, some, some data types that you need to protect, some things that are really important to your business or are legally bound to protect in a certain way, this is where they are. They're sat in JSON on the file system. So you need to make sure that you protect them, especially, you know, I'm a data guy. So especially if you're working with databases and you're pulling back data from production systems, you need to remember that no matter whether it's a PowerShell, a C Sharp, a SQL notebook that you're running, those results are going to be stored in JSON on the file system and you need to keep them safe. Okay, so that's a whirlwind tour of notebooks, and there's a lot to take in. We've got a lot of types of notebook. You've got a lot of different use cases. All I want to do with this session is to encourage you to explore these options, to understand what's available to you and to take them forward. 
So undoubtedly you will have your own ideas of how you can take these notebooks forward. You'll have other things that you can use them for. Please, anything that you want to take of mine, you can find either on my blog, on my GitHub account. All of the notebooks that you've seen are there as well. Please feel free, take them, modify them, move them forward. The only thing that I ask is that you let me know the cool things that you make. Because that's how we all learn. We all move forward learning stuff. Here are all of my details. And what we can do now is we can just have a chat. So if you have any questions, please feel free to send them to me. And let's see what we can do live.